Greetings and welcome to the 2020 Ask Historians Digital Conference, Business as Unusual, Histories of Rupture, Chaos, Revolution, and Change. This panel is entitled Indigenous Histories Disrupting Yours, Sovereignties, History, and Power. I'm your moderator, Al Ransom, though you may know me on, on Reddit as Anthropology Nerd. Over the next hour and a half, each panelist will deliver their paper. After the presentations, we will engage in a roundtable discussion and then end with a few closing remarks. As the following presentations are deep in scope, importance, and power, this introduction will be brief. The popular perception of indigenous communities stirs examples like the Maori of New Zealand, Australian Aborigines, the First Nations of Canada, American Indians in the United States, and, in, and Native South Americans. But indigenous peoples have a deep history on every continent. Though often marred by violence and oppression, these vibrant communities continue to boldly proclaim their identity their language, and their culture. They navigate in an evolving world where citizenship and personhood have been denied to those whose voices often differ from the national narrative. To be indigenous is often to be seen as an enemy in one's own country. What this panel explores then is a history denied, a history hidden in plain sight, a history willfully forgotten, a history forcibly exterminated. Because we seek a hidden history, the normal tools of a historian are not sufficient for us. The indigenous story is not found solely in dusty tomes deep in the library. To discover their stories, we must broaden our perspective. We invite you to join us as we listen attentively to oral history, think critically about source documents, re-examine our assumptions of civilization, and cast aside notions of superiority. If we are to understand how we arrived here, how we arrived at this place and time, we must examine the legacy of violence that created our world. From the prisons of Western and Central Asia to the high plains of South Dakota, indigenous peoples continue a centuries long fight to express their sovereignty, to guard their land, to thrive and grow and leave a greater inheritance for the next generation. Let's get started. Ali Al Jamri is a writer, poet, and member of the Baharna community. He holds an MA in Near and Middle Eastern Studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies. He will be presenting his paper, Countering Cultural Erasure Through Community History, Baharna as a Case Study. I'll hand it over to Ali. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me on the panel today. I wish to talk about cultural erasure and how communities can combat that. I'll be using the Baharna community, which is my own, as a case study. So a bit of background first. The Bahrain Islands are situated just off the eastern coast of the Arabian Peninsula. There are many communities in Bahrain today, including people of Arab, Bedouin, Arab Huwela, Persian and Indian descent. Each of these have their own unique and special histories worthy of their own focus. And though they're not the focus of this paper today, they're not forgotten either. As for the Bahana, they are the indigenous Arab inhabitants of these islands, descendants of the ancient inhabitants of this region, who are subjected to conquest, dispossession and serfdom. And it's on them that I focus on today. Now, you may not typically think of the Middle East or rather West Asia when we speak of indigenous peoples, but indigenous people exist across the world. Indigeneity is defined not just by the people's relationship to the land, but also to their suffering under colonialism. Indigeneity is important because of colonial violence. To talk about erasure, I'd like to first ask the audience to mentally rank your awareness of your own community's history. To consider this, how much of that history have you learned from schools, museums, and state-sanctioned sources? Hold that answer in your head. I'd now like to give a short history of the Bahana. The Bahrain Islands and surrounding coastline have been inhabited for at least 5,000 years, and its earliest known civilization, Dilmun, was contemporary to the Sumerians. We know that Bahrain was Arabized no later than the second century AD, as Ptolemy's Geographia mentions the Abdul Qais tribe, Many Baharna claim descent from the Abdul Qais tribe, and this genealogy establishes the very long settled history of the Baharna people. At the advent of Islam, the predominantly Christian Abdul Qais converted to the new faith. After the Prophet Muhammad's death in 632 AD, the Abdul Qais sided with his son-in-law and cousin Ali as his successor, becoming amongst the earliest Shia Muslims. This early Shia history is, for example, reflected in the shrine to Sa'sa ibn Sohan of the Abdul Qais, who was one of the standard bearers of Ali. The shrine stands to this day in Bahrain and is a testament to the long history of this community. 
the Baha'u'llah is still ascribed to the Shia faith today. The Baha'u'llah and their ancestors played important, often underexplored and underexamined roles in the region's history. Leaping to the 9th century, the Abbasid Caliphate witnessed the Zend Rebellion, a revolt by black slaves forced to work in the plantations of southern Iraq. The slave revolt was led by Ali ibn Muhammad, the son of a slave woman who claimed descent from the Abdul Qais tribe. During the revolt, which lasted 14 years, he drew on his relations in Bahrain for support. A few short decades after this rebellion, a fringe Ismaili Shia sect, the Qaranifa, conquered Eastern Arabia and ruled it for the next 170 years. They're best known for sacking Mecca in 930 AD. Reflecting this history, one village in Bahrain, Janabiya, still bears the name of Abu Tahir al Jannabi, the leader of the Karamita. When the Karamita fell in 1067, power transferred to a new local dynasty, the Ayyunids. Local Arab dynasties would rule Bahrain for the next 450 years. The medieval period is when people of the region begin explicitly identifying themselves by the term Bahana, and this, for example, is attested to by famous medieval religious cleric. Sheikh Maytam al-Bahrani, that family name being the adjectival form of Bahana. They also continue to be Shia, just as their first Muslim ancestors were, and their faith is attested to in inscriptions, coinage, and the writings of travelers like Ibn Battuta. Under the Ayyunids, the oldest mosque still standing in Bahrain was constructed. The Ayyunid history of the mosque, which is today a museum, is downplayed in the official literature regarding it. Among the notable successes to the Ayyunids was the Asfura dynasty, who I mention specifically because a prominent Baha'na family still carries the Al Asfur name to this day. Now, as we continue and enter the modern age, the Baha'na community underwent three traumatic ruptures in their history, which are crucial to understanding their indigeneity and the effects of erasure. In 1521, the Portuguese conquered the Bahrain Islands, constituting the first historic rupture. At the same time, the Ottomans occupied Eastern Arabia, politically splitting the islands from the mainland and the two Bahana communities who lived on either side apart. Never again would Bahana self-govern in Bahrain. The second rupture occurred in 1717, after Oman occupied the Bahrain Islands. State authority dissolved and ownership of the islands ping-ponged between regional powers. The islands were depopulated and impoverished by the cycle of violence. And in the same period, the region witnessed a dissolution of, straight, of central authorities. So the Safavids collapsed in Iran and the Ottoman Empire began to decline. Meanwhile, you had the first Saudi state establishing itself and Bedouin settlers founded small polities like Kuwait. All this paved the way for the third rupture in 1783. One of the Bedouin tribes who founded Kuwait, the Beni Uthub, broke off and migrated to the Qatar Peninsula. From there, they conquered Bahrain. The Baharna were dispossessed of their land and forced into serfdom. This new polity then entered treaty relations with the British Empire in 1820, so 40 years after that conquest. As I mentioned at the start, the Baharna identify themselves as belonging to these islands and the nearby coastline. Their identification with this land stretches back nearly 2,000 years, and as early as 1816, so one generation after that conquest, a British colonial officer described the Bahana in the following terms. The Aboriginal inhabitants of Bahrain, now subjected to a foreign power, suffer from the tyranny of their masters more keenly than language can express. Oral history and poetry from the 19th and early 20th century relate the arbitrary abduction of Bahrain women, murder of men, appropriation of land, random taxation and forced labor, evidencing the uh, statement by that colonial official. The British Empire expanded its hold on Bahrain over the course of the 19th century. By the 1920s, so 100 years ago, the mistreatment and the abuse of the Baharna was so extreme that the British intervened, forcing the abdication of the ruler and granting the Baharna basic protections. Multiple massacres of Baharna occurred in this time. In the long run, colonial interventions served to reinforce these divides. Modern Bahrain was built in part on the violence exacted against the Baharna community. So that is a very, very fast history. And having summed that up, I return to my question at the start. How much of your community's history do you know from official sources? Because of the history I have summarized, the answer would be none of it. So ties to the Abdul Qais, the distinctly Shia historical periods, particularly the medieval ones, the local dynasties whose descendants still live on the islands today, this is passed on only through Baharna oral and community history. 
If gaining knowledge about yourself and your history is an adventure you have to personally journey on, if it requires you to constantly question your received knowledge, if you find that the most important voices lie in sidelined oral histories, then your community has likely been subjected to erasure. Erasure is not accidental. It is a consequence of violence your community has been subjected to. The long Baha'i history cannot be studied without acknowledging the violence exacted on this community. As long as it goes unacknowledged, erasure will continue. So how is the community trying to combat erasure? I now want to provide a few examples. Baha'i history is everywhere on the islands. We have oral histories, poetry, textual records, and physical artifacts to back up the claim of a continuous and historic relationship to the islands. Instagram, which is the social media of choice in Bahrain, has become the unlikely home of countless local history accounts, with one for virtually every village and community in the Gulf. These accounts reach thousands. They record dialects, disappearing villages, and historical figures. They highlight the Abdul Qais history and genealogies of the oldest Bahrain families. Diaspora academics have also been crucial, as they are able to author texts which may be controversial at home and distribute them through social media. Volunteer archivists are hard at work to digitize their records passed through families with finds of records dating back over 500 years. In this context, the internet has been democratizing and a safe space. Activists and historians are careful in the subjects they choose and the language they employ, but with each post, they counter centuries of erasure. This has opened the door to further community engagement. Community activists are working on projects to capture the disappearing dialects and oral histories and visualizing them on maps collecting and translating 19th century poems orally transmitted to my grandparents' generation has been a project of my own. Community activists are now also looking at ways to empower young academics in order to shift the conversation in Western academia. Baha'i are confident in our own history and indigeneity, but it is not enough for ourselves to know our history. Orientalism and racism is still rife in the study of Arab peoples and the people of West Asia, and Western academic hegemony contributes to this erasure. We're working hard to undo such damage. A key takeaway then is that erasure is practiced not against an individual, but against entire communities. And therefore only community efforts can overcome it. Thank you. Thanks Ali. Next up is Wayne Buchanan. He is a cultural researcher at the Muckleshoot Cultural Division and holds an Associate of Arts from Centralia College and a Bachelor of Arts from Evergreen State College. He will be presenting his paper, Rupture and Resilience, the Muckleshoot People. Hatsahe, Wayne, Tita, Muckleshoot Hapsted, Tuol Ched, Skolatsapsh. My name is Wayne Buchanan. I'm enrolled in the Muckleshoot Indian tribe and I come from the Boise Creek people. Um, so, just a little note um, this history is public knowledge, it's not sanctioned history from my tribe or, or the preservation department or committee. So, just wanted to preface that. Uh, the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe is a small federally recognized tribe in southern Puget Sound, nearing Auburn and Enumclaw, Washington. We are a Washootseed Southern Washootseed dialect speaking peoples who have called Washington State our home for the past 10,000 years. Our name of Muckleshoot, Buckleshoot, and Washootseed derives from that of a place called Muckleshoot Prairie, where our reservation was established. Because of our tribe's complex nature, we are included within the Treaty of Medicine Creek and that of the Treaty of Point Elliott being one of the few dual treaty tribes in the United States. For the past 10,000 years, Muckleshoot people have been living in villages throughout the Green and White River watershed drainages and into the Salish Sea, known as the Puget Sound, nearing what we would call today Seattle. We subsisted first through salmon, then predatory and passive mammals, both sea and land, birds, greens, roots, fruits, nuts, and shellfish. We spoke Sahoptan, Chinook jargon at times, our primary language of Olshootseed, and eventually English, our political governing body was made up of CEOB families. We practiced polygamy and exogamy, which created vast kinship networks for trade and access to hunting and fishing grounds. Gifting was and is a staple of our culture, which would determine one's social standing and was used for various events such as potlatches and naming, death of loved ones, and much more. Our collective identities as Coast Salish peoples are rooted in our connection to the salmon and we can be defined as salmon people. We have held ceremonies since time immemorial, honoring and thanking the salmon for their generosity and kindness and welcoming them home. Our rivers provided an abundant amount of salmon which we smoked and stored for the winter season. We have always been welcoming and generous people which we portrayed at the first settler site. Our first rupture 
was a donation Lion Claim Act of 1850. It ushered upwards of 8,000 settlers into unceded Indian territory, entitling each settler claims to our land at 640 acres apiece. Then Governor Stephen Isaac Stevens pushed treaties quickly for this purpose. As a result of the DLCA, a settler named William Brannan staked a homestead claim just downstream of our biggest village of Alaco, where he could have corked off our salmon runs. Stevens appointed chiefs amongst our people to re represent as treaty signers, disregarding our current social life's politics to pursue treaties that would open up more lands to settlers. At Muckleshoot, we have a saying, it's your lie, you can tell it any way you want. With this in mind, it is essential to note that the live papers called the Treaty of Medicine Creek and the Treaty of Point Elliot originally had no land set aside for my Muckleshoot people, and the signing of them was a declaration of war against us. Additionally, the treaty gave unfavorable land that would lead to genocide to the Puyallup, Nisqually, and Squaxin peoples, totaling 1,200 acres for their respective tribes. Stevens was a West Point Academy trained engineer and surveyor. He knew what he was doing, and he knew the lands appointed will ultimately lead to the death of our culture, our subsistence, and our overall livelihood. With tensions ever increasing due to the inadequacies of Stevens' treaties and that of hostile invading settlers, our Muckleshoot people sought to remove illegal squatters off of our land. On October 28, 1855, an event your Americans call the White River Massacre occurred, wherein nine settlers were killed, among them, Brandon and family. Before this, they were warned to leave. Brandon ignored it. The White River Massacre is not to be conflated with real massacres, like one that would take place against the Nisqually Michelle people later on. It was, in fact, a removal of trespassers, which could be also be attributed as an uprising. The Treaty of Point Elliot was not ratified until 1859. Those settlers, only those who were not good people, were trespassers. And our removal was well within our rights, which we operated by, which is similar to the Stand Your Ground and Castle Doctrine laws in today's U.S. courts. This removal was the first act in a series of battles known as the Puget Sound Indian Wars, or as we Muckleshoots call it, the First Treaty War. To renegotiate the treaty's terms and make our message heard, our relatives answered the call to our arms due to the blood ties and close kinship. Instead of submitting to internment camps, our people, primarily Nisqually, Puyallup, Yakima, and my Muckleshoot people, rallied together to defend our homeland from invaders. After the intense battles from both my relatives and the United States militia, we entered a peace treaty during our stay east of the Cascades and eventually renegotiated at Fox Island Treaty Council. Perhaps this is one of the few wars against the United States government where land was regained through military resistance. The sacrifices of the warriors of the first treaty war returned 25,000 acres to our people. 17,000 of those acres restored the land to the Piala people, 4,000 to the Nisqually, and my Muckleshoot people reclaimed 4,000 acres as well. We went to war for the sole purpose of retaining our homelands and our sacrifices were well served. Though the establishment of our reservation in 1857 would be the first in a long line of limiting our sovereignty. Despite our victory of the first treaty war, federal and local Indian policy throughout the years got the best of us and ultimately led to our community land dwindling to half an acre with a community center burned down by teenagers from neighboring cities. Our people suffered from poverty where it was said to have been amongst the most impoverished tribes in the states. Additionally, the state of Washington passed laws that limited the tribe's right to fish for salmon. It would have been easy to live off of the land as we always have, yet we had no right to fish, to fish despite the treaties and Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution. Moreover, many years before, blowing up a side of a mountain to dam our rich waters prevented flooding in the Auburn Valley, virtually destroying our salmon population in the White River, and it permanently changed its flow from north to south. Because of this and tensions from 1900 to the 60s and 70s, an event transpired that we call the Second Treaty War, also known as the Fish Wars. Once again, we had to fight for what is ours through direct military action and the courts. Oddly enough, it was the descendants of the first treaty with warriors who participated in the second treaty war, confirming our status as warriors. Throughout the 60s and 70s, Muckleshoot held treaty treks and protests through canoeing and fishings, and collectively with our Puyallup and Nisqually relatives and all Coast Salish peoples participating in the second treaty war, the Bolt decision happened. Judge Bolt reaffirmed the treaties of tribal nations as set forth by Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution and entitled 50% all of all harvest to tribes and allowed Indians to fish in their usual and accustomed grounds. Together with Judge Bolt and President Nixon championing Indian rights, ultimately changing federal Indian policy from that of Indian determination, from Indian termination to self-determination, Indian rights protesters and Indians from all nations ushered in a new era for my Muckleshoot people.
Since the resurgence of ancient religious practices in the 1970s, canoe culture revitalization in 1989, opening the Muckleshoot Casino in April of 1995, the quest for reclaiming our ways as well as the robust economy we enjoyed before the invasion and occupation is in part due to warriors within and outside of the tribe. Muckleshoot is a historically rich tribe connected by ties of blood and marriage with the Puyallup, Nisqually, Suquami, Wenatchee, Kittitas, Palouse, Nooksack, Yakima, and even as far as the Salto Indians in Ontario, Toronto. The land that is now Auburn, Washington was traditionally called El Alco, the biggest Muckleshoot village with the United States government turned into settler homesteads and eventually named it Slaughtertown and then changing it to Auburn. Muckleshoot people have lived in their Aboriginal homeland for thousands of years. Strengthened by intermarriage for strategic and resource advantage, our migration from Longhouse Village to the reservation to individual allotments has all taken place within a few miles radii. We have always been here. Reclaiming our land base was chief among the tribe's goals when it became clear that our economy would recover through gaming. The tribe now owns more than 25 times the land base of its original reservation. Hi, that was great, Wayne. Thank you. Next up is Kyle Pittman. Kyle is a Nez Perce and Yakima descendant. He's a graduate student at George Mason University studying digital public humanities, as well as a moderator for Ask Historians. He'll be presenting his paper, Inherent Sovereignty, Disruptions to Indigenous Nationhood. That's Lahane. Ian Witnikissa, Kyle Pittman. Ian Nimipu. Good day. My name is Kyle Pittman, and I am a descendant of the Nez Perce and Yakima peoples. I grew up on the Puyallup Indian Reservation in Tacoma, Washington, but my family comes from our reservation in Idaho. I tell you this because proper introductions are important for many indigenous peoples. They serve to lay the groundwork for building all kinds of relationships, familial, social, or political. These kinds of in-depth descriptions of who we are and where we come from are key examples of the ways in which indigenous peoples conduct ourselves and have conducted ourselves for generations. Today, I want to focus on a particular area where customs such as this are implemented. This area concerns our existence as sovereign entities. Indigenous peoples have been historically marginalized and continue to face daily oppression from the modern nation's birth out of centuries of racism, colonialism, and paternalism. From the forests of Brazil to the halls of the Supreme Court of the United States, the preservation of our being on all fronts is under constant threat. To defend ourselves, we need to take advantage of the systems we've been introduced to and exercise our inherited will of survival bequeathed by our ancestors who sought to secure a future for their descendants. It is said among our communities that our ancestors were thinking not just about the next generation or the generation after that, but that they considered how to act in the interest of the next seven generations, a tenet that continues to guide us as those descendants. One of these considerations is the implementation of the concept of sovereignty. Indigenous peoples today encounter many struggles arising from either the challenging or erosion of the sovereignty our nations possess. If for the purposes of this discussion, I will be specifically speaking about the sovereignty possessed by the indigenous peoples who reside in what is now called the United States who are commonly referred to as Native Americans or American Indians. The sovereignty our tribes claim is of vital importance to the preservation of our status as polities and the ability to exercise a level of control that has gradually been disrupted, displaced, and dismantled. Even now, issues of sovereignty greatly impact the relationship between Native nations and the Western polities seeking to limit or even quell tribal political existence. Just this year, the Supreme Court case of McGirt v. Oklahoma saw the borders of the reservations in the state of Oklahoma restored to recognition as it concerns criminal jurisdiction over those who commit on-reservation crimes as these borders were previously ignored to the point of erasure. In 2018, the Supreme Court decision of Washington v. United States reaffirmed the understanding that culverts were obstructing salmon migration in Washington state, constituting a violation of the treaties signed between the federal government and tribes, and proving to be detrimental to both tribal cultures and the struggling salmon population. And in 2016, the struggle over the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline in North Dakota on the unceded traditional lands near the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation demonstrated more than ever the need to assert our sovereignty after the pipeline was relocated from Bismarck to right outside the reservation, a move based on health and environmental concerns for the city of Bismarck. But in order to understand how these challenges have come about and why Native nations are regularly acting to defend the sovereignty, we must examine the historical precedents for the claims to sovereignty. The Native nations of North America have interpreted sovereignty in our own contexts and exercised this since time immemorial, 
Barring a lengthy discussion on how to accurately define the term sovereignty, classifying it as a political status that entails a measure of jurisdictional power over a specific territory allows us to identify this quality in the historical record, and the manifestation of this jurisdictional power can be seen in the abiding by of customs of indigenous nations. For example, the indigenous Hopewell culture overlapped with the indigenous Adena culture throughout the Ohio River Valley, connecting with various spots through a vast trade network and spreading Hopewell culture enough that it extended from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico. They lived in permanent communities and practiced horticulture. And what set them apart from many other cultures is that they built monstrous earthen monuments. Tens of thousands of these mounds have reportedly been built across the country. It has been said that in order to accomplish this work, high levels of political and social refinement were required. On the east coast of the United States, the Haudenosaunee, commonly known as the Iroquois Confederacy, operated a complex government structure with a functioning constitution known as the Great Law of Peace and an alliance between several nations. The Haudenosaunee designated the lands within their boundaries according to the traditional homelands of the tribes that comprised the alliance, but noted that these boundaries existed because of linguistic differences, not a separation of national boundaries via politics. To accomplish this, it was recognized that each of the comprising tribes had to relinquish some of their existing sovereignty to the other nations of the Confederacy. The Haudenosaunee also created wampum belts, items comprised of beads or shells sewn into intricate patterns that were used sometimes to signify the forming of relationships. In other words, they were a formal means of ratifying treaty negotiations. To provide a more specific account, in the work Paper Sovereigns, Anglo-Native Treaties and the Law of Nations, Jeffrey Glover investigates the treaty making process between English colonists and Native nations in the 17th century. He reviews collections of English records as well as recorded Native oral accounts to paint a better understanding of the Native positions with regards to the treaty making process, an act of formal recognition of another nation's sovereignty. He particularly examined the writings of Gabriel Archer, who was the official recorder of the Virginia colony and who documented many of the encounters of Jamestown with Natives, particularly with the Powhatans. Glover contrasts Archer's observations of indigenous customs with how things were recorded with traditional European methods of establishing treaties. He says, quote, Archer's letter did not resemble what most Europeans would have recognized as a legal document of any kind, much less a land claim. There were none of the Latin formula so familiar in European treaties, no lists of witnesses, no signatures, not even the X marks found in treaties between the English crown and illiterate Irish clansmen. In a startling departure from European conventions, Archer offered an account of treaty making on Indian terms, pointing to the exchange of shouts and other indigenous rituals as proof of friendship between Newport, an English captain, and the Indian king. End quote. But while it is true that we could not write in the languages of the Europeans at first, the languages that most written documents would have been transcribed into, native nations were not ignorant of the treaty making process. And these treaties were to occur in our languages and within our realm. The records of English interactions with natives demonstrate that in order to survive, the early colonists insisted on following indigenous customs with regards to politics due to the simple fact that they couldn't afford not to. They were outnumbered and at times relied heavily on the native population to sustain them. But what this means is that from either an indigenous or a European perspective, it was noted that Native Americans were operating within our own geopolitical sphere of influence with our own complex systems of governance and territorial management, which strengthens the claim that we recognized our own right to our territories, our own laws, and our own distinct cultures, which all typically constitute the elements of sovereignty. A further evidence of this status was evident in later periods as well. In 1763, the British issued a royal proclamation that decreed settlers should abstain from settling beyond the Appalachian to preserve the territory belonging to the Indian nations that assist the British against the French. And even George Washington's administration acknowledged the sovereignty of Indian tribes as it gradually became cemented in American legal systems, if only to create a testimony of the sovereignty of the United States itself in the eyes of European nations through faux humanitarianism and civilized warfare. And definitively, Native nations considered ourselves sovereign, both by our own standards and the standards of Europeans. Over time, this understanding would come under scrutiny and the political status of Native nations would, and still does, swing like a pendulum, going from a more or less complete ranking of sovereigns to a diluted classification of domestic dependent nations. But we can see these drastic changes occurring in the 19th century, where the sovereign status of Indians was a given. Now it is riddled with limitations in the form of plenary power and connotations of quasi-sovereign status. As demonstrated, 
Native nations historically operated with similar characteristics of European nations, even garnering the recognition from these supposedly superior polities. Yet as colonization and westward expansion progressed into full-blown imperialism, the United States sought to diminish the status, attempting to disrupt the long-standing existence of Native nations. The Marshall Trilogy of Supreme Court cases enshrined the doctrine of discovery into the American legal tradition, resulting in the loss of land titles for American Indians. The General Allotment Act of 1887 dissolved communal land holdings of tribes and sold off so-called surplus lands. The Indian Citizenship Act of 1924 forced American citizenship on all American Indians. The 1934 Indian Reorganization Act shoehorned tribal governments into an Americanized format. The passing of Public Law 280 in 1953 ushered in an era of political termination and forced relocations to urban centers. And the criminalization of American Indian religious practices until 1978 and a lack of protection for our burial grounds until 1990 all constitute the marginalization and suppression of sovereignty spoken at the outset of this paper. It is for these reasons that I speak about indigenous sovereignty, bringing these disruptions to light and casting them against the unequivocal historical reality of our inherited sovereign status buttresses the importance of continuing the fight to preserve our right to self-determination. The existence of indigenous peoples as polities is not contingent upon the whims of colonial institutions or the allowance by hegemonic power structures or the descendants of invading colonizers. As demonstrated today, our existence as polities is rooted in historical fact. And as long as we continue to practice our ways of being, our sovereignty will not be disrupted permanently. Thank you, Kyle. That was, that was great. Next up, we have Miguel Rivas Fernandez. He is a third year history and French student at Manhattanville College. Originally, he is from the Dominican Republic. He will be presenting his paper, Remembering Malinche, the Evolving Role of Language in the Events and the Memory of the Early Spanish Conquest. Thank you very much. My name is Miguel Rivas Fernandez, and today I will be talking about language, its role in the early Spanish conquest of Mesoamerica, and how its use has evolved throughout time, as well as influenced our perceptions of these events and their image of their main characters. When Hernán Cortés and his party of Spanish conquistadores met the Aztecs and their ruler Moctezuma, the old world collided with the new world. The conversation between both men has generated much scholarship from historians who attempt to decipher the true meaning of their exchange. Being unable to communicate directly, the two men relied upon the translation of a native Nahuatl woman named Doña Marina, also known as La Malinche who became Cortez's interpreter as he traveled to the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan. As would be expected, nuisances were lost in translation, and Moctezuma's speech was not fully understood by the Spanish, nor accurately recorded by chroniclers. Misconceptions about what he had said have arisen, both from Spanish and Nahuatl sources, reflecting the influence that language, as well as its use and misuse, can have on how events are perceived. Marina's role as interpreter, as well as the conversations between Moctezuma and Cortes and the accounts of the encounter written by both Spaniards and Nahuas, all show the central role that language played in the early conquest, and also show the influence that language has had on the historical record and memory of the events ever since. A discussion on language and communication during the early conquest must start with the woman who facilitated it. Doña Marina was a Nahua woman of noble descent whom at a young age was sold into slavery to Maya people in the Yucatan region. Eventually, she came to be in the possession of Hernán Cortés, given to him along with 19 other women after the Spanish defeated the Tabascans. Moving from a Nahua region to a Maya region enabled Marina to speak both languages, and she was able to communicate with the Spanish through Jerónimo de Aguilar, another explorer who had been stranded in Yucatan years prior. Highlighting her importance, chronicler Bernal Díaz del Castillo makes it a point to tell Marina's story before narrating the meeting at Tenochtitlan, saying, quote, without the help of Doña Marina, we could not have understood the language of New Spain and Mexico, end quote. Later accounts, such as the Lienzo de Tlaxcala illustrated codex made with the help of natives, also emphasize Marina's role and presence, always depicting her centrally located between Cortes and the natives showing that both the Spanish and the natives viewed her as central to the narrative of the conquest. Doña Marina's central role in the conquest has earned her a mixed reputation in the historical memory. In her essay, Rethinking Malinche, Francis Cartunen explains how early historical recollections of Marina were positive, 
regarding her highly for helping defeat opposition to Cortez, bringing Christianity to the natives, and being mother to Martin Cortez, who is considered the first mestizo. Cartoonin makes the argument that a negative view of Marina became prominent as Mexico gained its independence in 1821, as she became a scapegoat for centuries of Spanish colonial rule. She became portrayed as a traitor to her race, as having aided the conquest in exchange for sexual favors from Cortes and in being the mother of mestizos, but this time not in the positive light of being the mother of Cortes' child, but in the negative light of undesired racial mixing. This association shows part of the complicated relationship that Mexicans have had both toward their mixed heritage and their past. In blaming Marina, Mexicans gained both an easy explanation for the events that happened and a way of, at least subconsciously, rationalizing their racial attitudes toward their heritage. As accounts from Marina's own point of view do not exist, it is impossible to know her true motivations. It is worth noting, however, that she was given to Cortez as a slave. So there is a possibility that a slave-master relationship has been understated in the historical memory. Despite this, it's clear that Marina both played a central role in the conquest and has featured heavily in the historical memory of the events ever since. Marina's role is perhaps most important when analyzing the conversation between Cortes and Moctezuma. Interesting differences can be seen in the portrayal of the speech by Cortes and the Nahua accounts within the well-known Florentine Codex. The following excerpt of Cortes' account portrays Moctezuma as very deferential to the Spanish. Quote, From what you say of the great lord or king who sent you hither, we believe and are assured that he, the king of Spain, is our natural sovereign. Therefore, be assured that we will obey you and acknowledge you for our sovereign in place of the great lord whom you mention, and that there shall be no default or deception in our part. And you have all the power in this land. I mean, wherever my power extends to command where is your pleasure, and it shall be done in obedience thereto, end quote. The Nawa account in the Florentine Codex differs from Cortes's, but interestingly, still retains some of the deferential tone of Moctezuma's remark, quote, I am not just dreaming that I have seen you and have looked at your face. I have been worried for a long time, looking toward the unknown from which you have come, the mysterious place. For our rulers departed, saying that you would come to your city and sit upon your throne. And now it has been fulfilled. You have returned. Go enjoy your palace. Rest your body. Welcome our lords to this land. End quote. It is interesting that both the Spanish and Nava excerpts have a deferential tone. And while it is easy to dismiss Cortes' account as trying to paint Moctezuma as giving up, analyzing the nuances of the encounter reveals a complex situation. In his book, Seven Myths of the Spanish Conquest, Matthew Russell gives two reasons. First, he argues that the system of royal patronage by the Spanish for the conquest encouraged the portrayal of an easy, rapid, and fruitful conquest, leading them to portray the natives as willingly submitting to Spanish rule, as can be seen in Cortes' quoting Moctezuma as saying, quote, and you have all the power in this land, end quote. The explanation for the deferential language in the Nahua account is more complex, and again raises the central role that Doña Marina played in the encounter. Restall explains that the structure of the formal Nahuatl language was very complex, taking different forms depending on who was speaking, and that the form that Moctezuma would have used was called tecpilatoli, or lordly speech. Restall explains that with lordly speech, quote, to be polite and cautious, one must avoid speaking bluntly or directly, which requires saying the opposite of what one means, end quote. Thus, Moctezuma's deferential language was intended to assert his powerful status. Complicating matters even further is Doña Marina's role as translator, as although she was able to understand lordly speech thanks to her noble origins, translating into Spanish erased the nuances of Moctezuma's words. Additionally, it is important to remember that Cortez's account was written within a year of the events, while the Nahua account in the Florentine Codex was written decades later. Evidently, Languages played an important role in the perception of the events surrounding the early Spanish conquest. It is important to remember that whoever is writing about an event always has a specific agenda in mind, and key to understanding these events is keeping the intentions of the writers in mind. Cortes and the other conquistadores had the goal of convincing the Spanish crown of an easy and fruitful conquest. The Florentine Codex was written with the help of Tlatelolco natives, and the subordinate position of Tlatelolco to Tenochtitlan and Moctezuma may have influenced the codex portrayal of the ruler.
The conversation itself was held through a translator, Doña Marina, who learned Spanish as a third language and was not fully equipped to translate Moctezuma's Nahuatl with all the intricacies of lordly speech. As Francis Cartunin argues, portrayals of Doña Marina became increasingly negative after Mexican independence, and she has been remembered as, quote, the most despised woman in Mexican history, end quote, with the word malinchista in Mexico being synonymous with traitor. All perceptions no doubt influenced by the centuries of negative language when telling her story. In defense of Marina, however, in the context of the 500th anniversary of the conquest in 2019, some have reassessed her image, arguing that she was not a traitor at all, and their argument is also based upon the language used to tell her story. David Marcial Perez, in an article for newspaper El País, argues that Marina was not a traitor because she was aiding her Maya brethren by allying herself with the people who could defend them against the threat of Tenochtitlan. The idea that Marina betrayed Native Americans is caused by the portrayal of indigenous people as a homogenous, unified group against the Spanish, instead of the multitude of groups that they actually were. By naming all the groups Indians or Natives, instead of Mexica, Tlatelolco, Tlaxcalteca, Maya, etc., one portrays the event in a Eurocentric idea of race, creating a situation where they are remembered as one unified group. And a figure like Marina, who may have looked to help her people in opposing Tenochtitlan, ends up being remembered as a traitor to her, quote, race, instead of being remembered for her central role in a complex series of events. Moctezuma might even be easier to scapegoat than Marina, as it was under his leadership that the Aztec Empire was lost to the Spanish. Analyzing the intricacies which surround not only Cortes, Marina, and Moctezuma, but also those who write about them, shows how important it is to understand the role that language played in the events that surround the early conquest and accounts of it thereafter, as well as the importance of acknowledging the role that language continues to play in our understanding of the events. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. We're now about to enter into our roundtable discussion. So first, uh, what a question I wanted to, us to address is, a couple of you have touched on how indigenous history really takes a different perspective. In the traditional view of history, we really highly value the written word. And we've seen from these presentations, there's no such thing as an unbiased written source, especially when talking about indigenous history. So for you guys, how do you account for that biased narrator in your research? How do you find the hidden story that's underneath? I guess uh, the way I'll tackle this first, I guess the way I do it is I try to, depending on what, what the context of it is, right, I'll try to see it how the indigenous peoples would have seen it. I try to put myself in their shoes, right? And I do the same thing with uh, my own people. Um, you know, that's how you decipher treaties, right? You, you view it as how the, uh, the treaty signers would have understood it. And so for me, that's how I tackle that question. I, you know, I, I take account in um, what the written word is, but I also take into perspective what, um, what they would have understood it as, depending on their political dynamics of their own way of governing, right? So yeah, similar, similarly to Wayne's answer, uh, a lot of us um, grow up with these kinds of stories, these histories, the uh, the alternate or the unknown or subaltern um, narratives that aren't uh, prevalent in the mainstream. And so for us, when we go out there and we recite these narratives, we're just saying the things that we grew up with. We're telling the, the truth, the reality that we've heard and experienced from our families from, uh, that have been handed down by our ancestors. And so, uh, you know, there is a struggle when we do that because sometimes it can run counter to what's, uh, what the mainstream narrative is. And that's when we have to fall back on our ability to get involved in these institutions, to learn the ways that we can present this information, to make that effective argument. So that way we can start to correct those existing narratives that are out there. I think there's a big space for imagination, compassion, and maybe even a little bit of role play in, uh, in terms of reading and understanding such sources. And you really have to think, you know, what's been left unsaid? And maybe those who are writing or relaying the sources, what are their blind spots? Um, what do they not recognize? Uh, so when reading colonial uh, sources, for example, this is a guy who is reporting to his boss usually uh, on, um, you know, and he wants to keep his job. So 
even thinking about all the other things uh, that come with a colonial document, you are reading reports from someone to their line manager often. So how are they presenting what they're doing? Um, and when you're thinking about colonial sources, that's one thing, and the written record. But also when it's passed down, you know, stories do change. Sometimes the exact fact is not the story that we receive, but there is a truth in the emotion. And sometimes we also have to, and sometimes when we can't find that original truth, we have to seek out what truth is there in the emotion of the story that is passed on. Along with what Ali was saying, I think it's very important always when reading written sources to think of who is writing this source, what their objective is, what their context is. So, For example, in the case of uh, Spanish conquistadores, these are people who are trying to justify their actions to the king of Spain. They're trying to get the money they need to continue conquering these lands. And specifically in Cortes's case, he was going against the wishes of the Spanish crown. So they're trying to justify something. And in that case, it influences this portrayal of something that happened really quickly, really easily. It's also important to uh, remember who's writing about somebody else. In the case of Doña Marina, there's not any accounts written from her own perspective. It's always other people writing about her. So it's important to remember what their objective is when they're writing about Doña Marina. Bernal Diaz says that without her help, they couldn't have done anything. But later on, after Mexican independence, she became this person who betrayed Native Americans because they wanted to find maybe a scapegoat for this Spanish colonial rule. And now that they're away from that Spanish colonial rule, they don't want to portray that as a positive thing. They want to portray it as negative. So it's always important to remember the objective of the writer in mind and their identity. That's a really good point, Miguel. Uh, I think another uh, aspect to that is also considering not just the position of the writer, right, but the position of the audience. Um, as you mentioned, you know, people might be looking for a scapegoat for whatever their reason is, but the people of today might be looking for that. And it's similar to when we're looking at these, um, these narratives, these accounts, um, these sources that we as people in general look at those and kind of put our own spin on it too. And that's why we need to ha uh, be critical when we approach these sources. Um, so for example, um, I mentioned uh, how even George Washington, first president of the United States, how his administration acknowledged the sovereignty of Indian tribes at his time, uh, which might run counter to how a lot of people think um, George Washington and a lot of the founding fathers of the United States might have viewed Indians. It is true that they were very racist, that they viewed Indians as savages and inferior, but it is also true that they viewed tribes as militarily and politically powerful, um, that they weren't tribes uh, that could just be subjugated on a whim, that there was a level of respect or reverence, hesitation at the very least, to try and encroach upon um, tribal territories without the ability to sustain a war against tribes in that case. And so bringing that back into what we're talking about, that's a, a kind of narrative that I think is lost maybe on a lot of people who look at American history um, and could be the case with any history that they look at because they're projecting uh, their own ideas, their own preconceived notions onto those narratives. And that kind of distorts what the historical record um, actually says. What I, a theme I'm kind of getting is that for indigenous history, you got to work a little harder, right? You got you to examine a couple different sources. So, you know, I, Ali mentioned even going into some archaeology and some sites, you know, Kyle and Wayne, you, know, you guys were talking about oral history and bringing that in. So how do you fold that together? You know, there's a lot of different strands that you have to weave together to tell the story. What are, what are you guys' thoughts about that? A lot of our history is locked within the tribes themselves. So there's a lot of history, you know, like say my tribe, for example, we don't really want the broad public to, you know, it's, it's not for them, it's for us, right? And, and that goes back to the whole principle of uh, intellectual property and you know, like uh, Greg Youngin did a really good uh, Elements of Indigenous Style Guide when writing about uh, Indian people, right? Families own these stories, right? Like my family owns the, star the story of the star child. 
So a lot of that is locked within individual families within a tribe, right? This concept, at least for here, this concept of a tribe is not, is not anything what you would really consider a tribe, right? It's a confederation of families, basically. And so these families own all these individual stories, and you have to go to each of them. You have to uh, ask for these stories to really get the, the, the oral tradition down. And then, you know, they might have some oral history for you too, right? Um, Dr. Joshua Reed, um, he wrote a, a book about the Makah. Um, he does a really good job about um, blending oral tradition into modern academics. Just a very good book. But for me, that's the best way you would go about doing this. Um, yeah, do the, you know, the Western academic thing, but uh, also focus on oral history and the people that you're, you're really researching, right? I mean, develop that relationship with them. Yeah, there's a a level of ethical procedure to follow when it comes to working with um, these kinds of sources and uh, interdisciplinary, too, as as well, trying to navigate your way through these um, different methods, these different sources to see how they work with each other. Um, So, you know, in my in my studies, um, anything concerning indigenous histories, you're going to be looking at a variety of sources, regardless whether they're written, whether they're oral, whether it's archaeological, um, it. And it's necessary in order to paint this full picture. And in my opinion, I relate that back to a large part of that uh, necessity to to look at these different um, disciplines and these different sources uh, is related to colonialism itself. Um, and as is well known with the Spanish conquest of, of Mexico, uh, sources were destroyed, right? These, these works um, by the Maya, by the Aztecs were intentionally sought out to be destroyed. And is, that is the case too with many of the tribes further north as well, where our own ways of telling history and reiterating things um, were destroyed or because we might have had different lifestyles were not preserved in a way that is common in Western cultures, in the Western world. So it does require a bit more level of work um, to be more in depth, to be more involved. Uh, and it does make that difficult at times, but especially for those who have a vested interest in these histories, it's the work that needs to be done. And I think that's why we're willing to go through and to commit ourselves to that work. I think Carl and Wim have talked great about the methodologies in this regard. I think one other thing about this is as you pull together from so, such a variety of sources, it makes you recognize, it, it, it creates a sense of humility, I think, in the researcher that the written word cannot be taken at its word. But to accept that, then that means that not everything, that every, nothing can be fully taken at its word. We are always creating a picture, a representation of that past history. And we are trying our best to understand it, but we must also recognize that we do not have the full picture, even as we smash the idea that these old written texts written by a colonizer were the full picture and were accepted as a full picture. When we break that, we have to accept that that is an incomplete picture and what we are presenting is also, to a certain extent, an incomplete picture. And I think that that's actually, um, that's not a position of weakness. I think that's a position of strength and it's a position of like maturity towards the work. I think what Ali is saying about there not being like a complete picture ever is important because there's always going to be multiple sides to any story. And I think that's one of the things about studying history that one add difficulty to it, but also to make it very interesting because you can always find different ways to portray a story, to piece together a story. And it's always worth keeping in mind that there's always gonna be a different perspective on that while you study it. So you're never gonna reach a level of perfection with the story you're trying to understand or trying to tell. And that I think is also important to remember when trying to put together these stories. So a lot of you are teachers, right? Or you have students or even we're reaching out through Ask Historians to teach. How do you teach somebody that's coming from a very probably, you know, uniform Western mindset What tips and tricks do you advise for them to say, okay, you got to look a little deeper now, right? You can't just read that one source. So how do you help them? How do you get them along going on that process? Yes, uh, it depends what we're teaching, right? So um, I do a lot of, you know, teaching about my culture and um, 
our history and everything. Um, one of the one of my favorite things to do, at least with regards to um, the Second Treaty War, the Fish Wars here, I like to bring people from you know you know this Western mindset who may or may not be allies, but they're genuine genuinely curious. <laughs> I bring them to these fishing forums where it shows the overt racism from these fishers here in Washington State and showing how what they don't know about our tribe they think they know but it's wrong in every aspect even in western academics right so i I show them the nuances of of the the other side right and then i show them how what we are right um you know you can't really define my tribe right but you can show a different aspect of our life compared to what you would see on the internet the internet's not a good source to learn about my tribe to begin with, but I use it as an example to show the differences. And that shows, you know, um, with students that I've had that shows, oh, wow, these, these people really don't really understand what my tribe is. They think that we're, we were never really a tribe, right? And then, I mean, we're federally recognized. So, I mean, obviously. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a precarious situation at times. Um, you know, speaking for myself, I, I love to teach other people. I love to talk about um, these histories, talk about my interests and, and provide that education, especially when, if we're talking about the general public, um, a lot of it's unknown or there's um, inaccuracies or outright lies to to contend with. But it does get uh, emotionally um, exhausting. It, it's laborious work, um, especially when you're in a situation where you might be one of the few people who has access to uh, this information or who's spent the time to study this information to try and bring it out to others. Um, And, you know, it it does create uh, uh, times where you don't really want to, you know, as was said previously, there's a vested interest uh, for indigenous peoples to talk about these things, um, to right the wrongs um, that have been co- uh, committed in history. Uh, and so I think, you know, for myself, I seek out opportunities to do so, whether that's getting involved um, in institutions of higher education, whether that's getting involved on Reddit to address these uh, misconceptions. And probably, you know, one of the most effective things that I keep in mind or maybe not effective, but one of the one of the most helpful things I keep in mind is remembering that people don't know what they don't know. Uh, people are victims of these systems, are victims of these narratives that have uh, been um, perpetuated. You know, even many indigenous peoples have fallen victim to these very same narratives, and so. It's very difficult when you think of it that way to judge others for their ignorance. Um, And based on that, right, for me, that's a motivator to keep talking to people and and to keep educating others um, with breaks in between, because it it is quite a bit to try and fight these narratives every day. But remembering that if I'm not going to do it, who else is going to do it, right? I think for me, uh, since I'm still a student, I can give sort of the opposite perspective of what we as learners, as people who don't know, can do to improve our learning. And I think for me, the most important thing and what has worked the best is always having an open mind to having these sort of conversations, always want trying to ask questions if you don't know, and especially keeping an open mind towards being wrong on something. You're not always going to be correcting your assumptions or even in your discussion if you are talking to somebody who knows more about you, more than you about something, then realize you might be wrong about that and just be open to listening to that person and learning from what they have to tell you. And don't be afraid to ask questions, especially in, with resources such as Ask Historians, you can always ask a question if your question isn't proper to ask, they will let you know and you can find a way to find out what you want to know in a better way. I think when it comes to um, West Asian history, which is not a very caught on term yet, but when you talk about Middle Eastern history, you are immediately talking about a region defining it by its colonial relation to the West. Um, You're talking about decolonizing history as such. And even within academia, and in Middle Eastern studies, you know, I've got a master's in Middle Eastern studies, so I'm no better in this regard. 
there's so much that needs to be done in the academy in terms of viewing this history from multiple perspectives and understanding how to do that, uh, let alone before you get to the public history side. So I don't have much of an answer. I think everyone's answers have been amazing, but it is a constant process and a learning process to figure out how best to do this. And not all, and different disciplines of history can certainly learn from each other as well, because I think at least in the Middle Eastern departments, we're probably a little bit behind in this. And I think that's a, uh, hear, hearing your response to Ali and, and Miguel, that reminds me of a, another point is that we have to spend um, time not just talking about content or trying to talk about these narratives and relay this information to other people. But what's really helpful too is if we can have a discussion with someone about how to understand history, how to interpret sources, how to um, uh, apply the historical thinking process and the historical method to learning about the past. It's interesting. Uh, there seems to be a, a popular notion, I, I feel like, at least for me when I was growing up, that history is boring and you don't want to get into history. And now, you know, as, as you get older too, and you, you hear people who do talk about history, there's a lot of, uh, of a, a popular conception of how history is understood in general, where it's comprised of just facts, right? You, if you know facts about history, you know history or you're learning history, um, which isn't the case. Uh, I'm sure all of us can attest to that too. When you're studying history, you need to be able to understand that it's an interpretive work, that history isn't a set in stone thing in the sense that A happened, then B happened, then C happened, and that's the story. Uh, rather, as we've been talking about, people, the people who we talk about in history, these characters or, or actors um, in these narratives, a story, right, are their own persons, have, are in their own contexts, are uh, beset with all the kinds of influences and biases and opinions that we ourselves have today. And that having a conversation with someone to discuss that very thing goes a long way in helping them to understand when we introduce different narratives that they might not be accustomed to, to helping them understand that there are different approaches to learning and doing history. And I think that really helps leave the door open for greater discussion as well, um, particularly for us when we start talking about indigenous histories that has suffered from being historically marginalized and suppressed and outright destroyed. One of the key themes that kind of went through a lot of your discussions was avoid the homogeneity of the people that you're talking about, right? Like, mm -hmm. don't just lump everyone together. I don't know if anyone would like to speak to that a little bit more not, now that we're playing around with some of the themes as a effective tool almost in countering that idea of there's one story. I can uh, bring in an example from my paper of lumping people together in in how uh, people have written about the conquest of uh, Mesoamerica, usually they mention it's the natives versus the Spanish or the Aztecs versus the Spanish. And that removes a lot of agency that many of these uh, Native American groups had within that story. As I think Kyle was saying earlier, just like in North America, the Spanish had to ally themselves with certain Native American groups to be able to defeat the Aztecs. And homo homogenizing all these groups as just one group uh, removes part of the agency that somebody like Doña Marina might have had in trying to help her people against the, the Aztecs or maybe these other groups that allied themselves with the Spanish against the Aztecs because they were subordinate to, to Nazi-Land and they did not want to be. So they allied themselves with somebody who they saw could help them, even though ultimately in the end that might not have worked out the way they wanted to. So it's important always to remember, for me at least, that history is the story of all people and people are different. And like, you can't always generalize too much because then you lose part of that story. And there's a thing which came to my mind of listening to your paper as well, which is that oftentimes, well, one, indigenous people's history is very complicated and indigenous people are not a hive mind and that the term indigeneity and labels themselves in general are reductive and often essentializing. 
they end up with terms of like all indigenous people were X. Um, and that is helpful in so far as it gets you talking about the indigenous people and then immediately stop servicing um, the conversation, right? Because the real history is in all that complication in between, you know, people who were all each acting within what they thought were their best interests. And sometimes it doesn't make sense how people act if we see it as indigenous versus colonizers, does it? Does it, that those terms themselves just paper over all of the complexity of a society um, so even when talking about it, we need to kind of remember um, all of those um, conflicting voices and also the voices that we don't hear. So uh, one thing that's very powerful uh, about uh, your paper as well with Donia Marina is uh, we don't hear uh, women's voices from themselves. They don't speak for themselves, unfortunately. Their, their voices have been lost. So we get a very male perspective on that history as well. Yeah, I think there's a lot that can be, that needs to be unpicked from those labels. Yeah, the uh, homogenizing is, is something that happens I, on all levels. I mean, even we're talking about history or if we're even talking about today, I mean, that, that happens very regularly with indigenous peoples uh, just in general social conversation. Um, and it, it truly is unhelpful. Um, and I, yeah, I feel like there might be some who think that if we're talking about the, the uh, distinctions between indigenous peoples and talking about their agency in history, that um, right, it, it's opening it up to, to discussions of even more competitiveness, right? Because as, as has been talked about as well, there's this idea that it's the natives versus the colonizers. And if it's like, oh, well, actually it was the colonizers and some of the natives versus this group of natives and those natives, right? It's setting it up for a, a more uh, framing it as a, as a competition or, or something else reductive like that. Um, rather, it should be framed as, as Miguel is saying, it's a history of people um, talking about how everybody has their own influences, has their own uh, ways that they push for things. Um, and this is true even on an individual level um, where you know, we, there are tribes today, the, uh, the Crow tribe, for example, right, who are known for lending a lot of their uh, people to Custer to be his scouts. Um, and that might fly counter to this idea that Plains Indians in general um, were all fighting against Custer and the colonizers. Um, so it creates this distortion in history and sets it up to make it more competitive, I think, too. So even when we're talking about the distinctions between indigenous peoples, really we need to focus on that nuance and take the time to explain you know what was this group uh talking about what was their agenda what was this group talking about what was their agenda and that does make it more uh laborious it makes more work for us when we start talking about these histories but it is important especially when we're trying to give that accurate representation of what's happened in the past Right, you guys make a lot of good points, and to Ali and, and your point, for example, here in the PNW, um, people have this idea where it, in Indian history in general, right, it's it's us versus them, it's colonizers versus Indians, you know, cowboys and Indians. It doesn't, people take things face value. I mean, you see that in social justice movements and all, virtually all across the board, right? In the same way here with cowboys and Indians and, and uh, colonizers versus Indians, it rejects, it ignores the nuances of the history for example you know the hudson bay company you know all across the board it was a common practice to take indian wives to get access to trade and everything and through this relationships were developed you know it's where hybrid indians came into play and everything right in our own Muckleshoot history we, we lived in peace with uh, settlers it wasn't until the donation land claim act came that it ushered too many settlers at too fast of a time period so that's why the hostilities happen. But when you generalize everybody, you're just ignoring all the nuances that happens that people just don't want to learn about or they just don't even know about. And, and uh, you know, I, I think it should also be said too, 
because I think we here understand this, right? But considering um, those who might not be familiar with our audience, right? This isn't a, a justification, of course, for colonization or a, a justification for atrocities that happened um, because indigenous actors in the past might have um, sided with colonizers, right? So to speak, uh, but rather it's remembering that as we've been saying, uh, historical actors have that agency, that they have the ability to make decisions that um, either aid them or uh, hurt them uh, in these situations. And that there are times where, you know, outside circumstances, external factors are thrust upon them. Um, if we're talking in very general terms, right, uh, as is common, grouping all indigenous peoples, yes, indigenous peoples, I would argue as a whole, have suffered under colonialism. But that doesn't mean that in every single instance or every single case, right, that indigenous peoples um, were the noble savages uh, who were miraculously um, perfect beings who were living in, in harmony with everybody, right? That creates further areas uh, for stereotypes and tropes to, to develop that hurt us even today. Uh, indigenous, I think indigenous peoples as a whole suffer because of this noble savage idea, because then it starts to get into arguments of inferiority, um, being simple minded. And so I, you know, I think uh, a good way to talk about this, right, is remembering that, as again, Miguel said, and pointing to that again, right, talking about history, you're talking about the story of people. This idea of being active agents in their own story, right? A lot of indigenous history or the perspective from a colonial approach is they're constantly forced into reactionary roles instead of being independent actors in their own right. And so in that theme, is there any, anything that you would like to share from your research or study about the importance of placing that active role, that active agent in their own way of navigating the world and that we kind of lose when we just see it from a very uh, colonialist perspective when we read only those sources. Yeah, I think when we look at those sources, we have to remember they are elites typically writing to another elite audience and that they do not, they usually do not understand this subaltern, this indigenous community that they might be writing about. And in one, one example of that in my study was around uh, events in 1923, which led to the application of Bahrain ruler and preceding that, there were a lot of Baharna petitions to the British. So the British had kind of, uh, the, the Bahraini ruler had his court and the British had kind of established their own rival colonial court. And the Baharna were being oppressed and they petitioned the British court. So what we see in the British records is there's a very derisive um, British resident as the, kind of the most senior colonial agent is called. The, the resident was talking about Bahana as being these kind of um, weak people um, who cannot take their own destiny into their own hands, who are just there to be oppressed and rather, you know, they, they kind of deserve their oppression if they can't do anything about it other than to talk to us. In fact, and this work hasn't um, really fully been done in academia, but in fact, the act of petitioning itself was an active response to their oppression. They, they saw that there were two courts as such, two, two governments, play, uh, and they played one off the other, and it actually benefited. So what the, when the British forced the application of the ruler, the Baharna got some basic rights. Um, so in that way, they actually succeeded. And this is usually seen as the British were kind of forced by a lot of public pressure. Iran was staking a claim on the Bahrain Islands at the time at the League of Nations. They needed to be seen to do, um, to be making reforms. The Bahana as an active agent usually doesn't get played. It's, it's just seen as the British making decisions on a kind of an international relations level. Um, at the League of Nations. So that is something where it's, and it's easy to make that conclusion because the records are written by the British and they are racist and they are derisive and they are essentializing and reductive. But this is what I mentioned before that like you have to think about what is unsaid or what is missed by what are the blind spots. And the blind spot is that they, these people did not even, did not see that, that petitioning itself was an active 
I'd also reckon to say when we approach uh, approach this subject, right, and we start um, ignoring the, that level of agency, we start also attributing things, concepts, actions, uh, whatever it might be, to the colonizing force. And that contributes to a further erasure of not just the agency, but the identity um, of in- indigenous peoples. So, for example, um, I've written before uh, on the concept of freedom of religion, particularly among my tribe, the Nez Perce. Um, And I think it's an interesting concept to explore in of itself, but also when compared to the notions um, and the concept and principle of of religious freedom as usually being seen as as a Western ideal, something that would have been brought to us or something that um, we we would not think of or accept on our own. And while there is a lot of um, controversy or debate uh, among many Nez Perce today uh, about the impact of Christianity in our history and how that affected colonization, um, there is evidence showing that many Nez Perce at, at the beginning of the introduction of Christianity, for example, were rather accepting of it, and that many Nez Perce did convert, and that while there might have been periods of conflict or strife, I would argue that it was no more than what you might encounter nowadays in places that uphold this concept of religious freedom. And I say that to, again, demonstrate that the colonizers uh, or colonizing forces are not the progenerators of all of these concepts um, or ideas that we, that we now think of as, a, as being Um, originating from the West. Uh, Even the idea of democracy, which I kind of touched on um, in an indirect way, talking about the Haudenosaunee, who are well known for having their own constitution, the great law of peace, for having democratic processes um, implemented and built into their systems of governing. Um, Well before the United States was a nation, well before uh, North America was being colonized. And so these ideas... uh, are important to acknowledge because it is a testament to the uh, agency of indigenous peoples that we have the ability to create concepts that we can even find nowadays um, and uh, further speaks to our ability um, to to be in charge and have that self-determination a lot of things that you know are typically ignored in in these mainstream narratives to me i would say it's and it's basically the point of my paper. It's about the language being used to talk about these stories. Like to take on what um, Kyle was saying about religious freedom in the, during the Aztec conquest, many groups adopted Christianity as well, but they adapted parts of Christianity into their religion, which had that flexibility but the way the Spanish write about this is in like the light of heresy and how the Indians were rebelling against the Spaniards. Meanwhile, in, in a native American perspective, it's more adapting to their situation and uh, trying to like maintain their sovereignty against the Spanish in the case of how they were told it was a rebellion. So the way the language is used to talk about these events has a large influence on how we perceive them. And even in how our culture generally, like modern culture nowadays, remembers these people, remembers these events and these groups. And Wayne, you mentioned something that I wanted to bring up that um, it kind of comes up in a lot of discussion of settler colonialism. And that is the idea that the landscape can fundamentally change with settler colonialism versus what native communities were using beforehand. So even if you get those lands back, the ecology is gone, right? The original ecology has been ruptured. So for your people, with the role of the salmon and with the linkage to that as a huge part of your culture, that's not only an ecological rupture, that's a cultural rupture. So how do you repair that damage? How How are your people working to repair that? Uh, well, long story short, there's really no way to repair as it once was, right? Uh, and with regards to blowing up the side of a mountain, you know, mud mountain dam, uh, unless we go up and blow the dams, which we should, but there's really no way because I guess the best we can do is resist, and we do that right now with uh, fish hatcheries, you know. It takes $60,000 to raise one single salmon, and that's how much we're invested. We're primarily, you know, uh, Northwest Indian Fishing Commission with all the tribes here in Washington state are 
the biggest factors in salmon still being here, you know, because of these canning industries back in the early 1900s and late 1800s, you know, virtually just all, all the factors, right, dams and everything. Um, and, and directly with regards to changing the landscape, you see, you see that in Seattle, Washington right now, a lot of Seattle is built on our villages and there's a lot of history there. We share a lot of history with the Duwamish tribe. Um, so it's really complex, but we have a lot of village sites there and they're all gone. Like every, rivers have changed, uh, mountainsides are gone. The landscape is just totally destroyed. So the way we can really go about it is just going to where that spot used to be, whatever it was. We hold first salmon ceremony and salmon homecoming, salmon homecoming specifically in Seattle, right on, right on Pier 57 and you know, we welcome the salmon home and everything, right? That's really the only way we can we can keep our culture despite these ruptures. Seattle is a big city and the landscape's totally changed compared to what it used to be. Same with Auburn, right? Our river flows south instead of north now. And so right at the confluence, the forks is where our village was. It's no longer there. It's replaced by an 8th Street, Eighth Street Bridge in Auburn. And I think a lot of it too rests um, with what Miguel was talking about uh, in this uh, adaption process. The indigenous peoples uh, were thrust into this chaotic uh, post-colonial uh, situation where in order to, to meet those changing circumstances and these external factors, right, we had to adapt. Our ancestors had to adapt and overcome and make do with um, what we now find ourselves in and that includes ecologically that there are some scars um uh, on the lands that are our traditional territories that won't heal or it, it is going to take many many generations for them to heal and so in order to accommodate that we have to adapt and i think wayne brought out a good example um the damage done to the salmon population it, it can't be stated what what in just the time we have left to, to talk about the massive amounts that the industry, salmon fishing industry, fishing in general has done to um, the salmon population where our ancestors, our grandparents can talk about how, you know, where salmon were prevalent, you could walk across their backs when they were coming back. Um, now you don't see that anymore. Wayne brought out how the tribe invests into, uh, into helping the population rebound. And that's an example of that kind of resilience, that kind of resistance, that kind of adaptation to the situation um, that indigenous peoples are used to doing by now, where we have to adapt to these situations, um, particularly imposed by colonial forces uh, that limit our ability to fully exercise our independence and to you know make those changes ourselves. We adapt to what's now there. Uh, and it makes it difficult to do, but of course we do that adaptation with the hope of getting back to what once was. I think it's also important to contribute to cultural and historical institutions that try to keep these stories and these memories alive. Because, for example, in the case of Tenochtitlan, it used to be a beautiful city built within a lake. They, uh, the accounts by the Spanish say it was as beautiful as Venice. But it was destroyed by the Spanish after the conquest, and they built Mexico City on top of it. And eventually, they even drained the entire lake. And all that remains is Mexico City. But there are institutions, there's museums and libraries within Mexico City that try to keep this memory alive. And it's good and important to always contribute to these institutions, as well as the people who study these stories and try to keep them alive. Ali, this gets back to something that's really important for your community, right? Yeah, I think in um, Bahrain, as well, the, kind of the environmental and ecological damage um, in the islands is immense. It's been deserted by over about two generations. Um, spring water that used to flow freely from underwater springs has all dried up and people remember these things and people share these um, uh, digitally and creatively. And I think, you know, what Wayne said was, I found it quite uh, very moving. And one of the things about this really is um, keeping the memory alive. Uh, it's often very difficult to repair the damage. Like how do you bring back uh, springs which, um, you know, from which water flowed for thousands and thousands of years and in a lifetime have disappeared? I'm not sure if you can, 
but simply by remembering that it was there and that it has um, been damaged and taken away, partly by a lack of care about that land um, by capitalist forces. Um, by having that memory and retaining that memory, then you can act on it. Um, so the first step to me is this kind of act of public history. Okay, guys, we're about to wrap up with our last question. In graduate school, one of my favorite professors always used to say, why do we care? Like you spend all this time on research, you spend all this time and energy and blood and sweat and tears trying to write this history, do this research, present it to the public. So why do we care? Why do we care about what you're studying? There's not a lot of people that do care, right? So being a tribe, being in a peoples that have been so close to extinction so many times because of, because of settler colonialism, right? It's important for us to, to care. For me specifically, I care because not a lot of people are actively going out to preserve our culture, to preserve our way of life. And without our way of life, who are we? It's, it's at that point that we will officially become assimilated. That's why it's so important for us to care, to carry on these traditions, to preserve the knowledge of who we were, who we are, where our people are from, where our villages were located, our relationship with not only the land, but all of our relatives, all the animal people, all the bird people, insect people, everything. That's why I care is because I need to, I need to keep, and my people need to keep us all on our toes and you know, preserving, you know, as Kyle said, the next seven generations. Yeah, to echo Wayne's words there, uh, and I think has been noted several times throughout our discussion here, uh, you know, is that we're speaking about histories that have been attacked and suppressed and distorted and marginalized. And if we're not going to care about it, who will care about it? Because it's shown that many people don't care about it. And that's led us into these situations that we have now. Um, to speak about these things not only is of grave importance for us to preserve who we are and um, who we were, but also I think it's of grave importance to everybody in general. Uh, you know, John Trudell, who is a, a really well-known indigenous activist and, and uh, poet, he says that if you go back far enough, we're all indigenous. And to think about it that way, to recognize that we all have places that we come from, that, that our people originate from, we should care about that. We should take care of those places. We should take care of those histories uh, because they matter. They should matter to everybody. And what happens to indigenous peoples, in my opinion, really is indicative of the situation that we see developing around those situations. Um, and our fights for sovereignty impact other people as well, uh, recognizing that many people live on the lands that belong to our people, that, uh, that they interact at some sort of level, whether it's politically, economically, even culturally with, uh, with our people today. Um, it, it's important because there is that relationship. And so I would say to, to end it, that we're all accountable to those relationships. And that's a major teaching for many indigenous peoples is that you're accountable to those relationships. It's your responsibility to be so. Uh, and so I care because it's my duty. Um, to echo what Cal just said about uh, if we go back far enough, we are all indigenous. I think it's important be, to understand because it is our history. It is the story of who we are, where we came from. It's the story of our identity as people, as nations, and as humanity as a whole. It the events that happened in the past shaped the world we live in today and will continue to shape the world we live in in the future. So it's important to understand how our actions can impact the future and keep these stories alive to understand where we come from. I think as well, it's, it's important for understanding ourselves. And actually my closing remarks relate to that. So I'm going to avoid answering from that perspective. But it's also important to understand our fellows. So wherever I talk about Baha'i history and Bahraini history, um, because there are other communities who all interact with each other, I focus on my own, um, but there are others. 
um, I always get responses of, oh, I didn't know that. That's so fascinating. I want to learn more. I didn't realize I wanted to learn more from people who are from Bahrain and are from beyond Bahrain. Um, but also when I speak to friends from Iraq, from Kenya, from Chile, from Palestine, from uh, Pakistan, Everywhere that I have these conversations, we discovered that there are commonalities and patterns and actually my learning to understand about your culture and your learning to understand about my culture, we understand our own better. And that is because we are all, you know, as we've been talking about it, history is about people and people are, inter are, are interlinked and people don't change that much you know our values and our societies change but emotions don't and how people act on those emotions in a lot of ways don't change um that's a very reductive statement <laughs> to me. but um but it's those it's it's talking about that and creating those links and i find that is the most important all, all the important stuff comes from those connections made well, that was amazing, guys. I want to thank you all for your passion, for learning a ton and the, and the wisdom that you have to share and all the results of your hard work that you've obviously poured into the, not only the papers that you made, but also the thought and ideas that you bring to the discussion. So I really appreciate that. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to go into closing remarks. And first up will be Ali. Thank you. It's been such a such an interesting conversation. So, I guess my final remarks wanted I wanted to make them around this question of why is it important to talk about indigenous histories and cultural narration? Kind of our last conversation, in a way. And for me, it's because ignorance of ourselves is a consequence of colonial violence, and we cannot understand ourselves today without knowing our histories. But even if we don't know our histories, we inherit uh, the experiences and the past traumas and we bring them into the present so if we don't know those histories then we can't address and overcome those tra traumas and ignorance is a trauma of its own and it's a tool of marginalization and we haven't really talked about marginalization uh, in this chat but i think that is the reason that we talk about indigenous histories um, the way history is written and studied tends to focus on elites and this renders people, they rule over as passive victims of their situation, but these peoples are never passive. Um, to counter cultural erasures, to conduct real and meaningful history, and it's exciting to participate in, and it's been a joy to be part of this. Okay, so thank you all for this opportunity and this discussion that we've had. For my closing remarks, I want to emphasize again how important the use and misuse of language is when we study history and how much language can influence um, not just the academic study of history, but our culture in general and how important it is to keep in mind the use of language whenever we're dealing with historical things. The original motivation for my paper came from when I saw the title of a telenovela that basically said everything is Malinche's fault. It's all about like how the world we live in today is influenced by these historical events and by the way we've spoken about them throughout the centuries, how we've written about them throughout the centuries. And it's very important always to keep in mind who is writing, what their objective is while writing, and that there's always multiple sides to every story. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to say thank you, Katsuyao, in the name and uh, the word of my people, um, for this chance that we've gotten to have here to discuss these things. They're very important topics, subjects that we've discussed here today uh, that matter not just for us, but I believe for everybody. And uh, for a closing remark, what I'd like to say is what many people might not know is that the original words for many tribes, the names that we have for ourselves, uh, for the Nez Perce, it's Nimipu, they often translate into words or phrases that include the people or people. Uh, and I think that's an important thing to talk about because it, when talking about indigenous histories, far too often are we dehumanized. 
uh, in the process of marginalization and the process of colonialism uh, through genocidal actions, indigenous peoples often suffer from that dehumanization. And so I'd just like to leave off on a final remark to have everybody remember that indigenous peoples are people. And when you learn about our histories and you learn about who we are and our identities, we communicate that to you. So when I tell you that I'm Nimipu, I'm telling you that I'm a person, that I come from the people. Indian people often say that our past is our future. And I see this reflect in today's panel with Miguel, with Ali, with Kyle. It's also said that our relationship with the past and the future, Indian people are a bridge between that for many, many aspects of life. So I, I with my closing remark, I got nothing to say other than, uh, hey Shaba, Ali, hey Shaba, Miguel, hey Shaba, Kyle, and Al, he's co, and my audience, how it tubes chill up. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. As the presentations and ensuing discussion highlighted, issues of sovereignty, identity, resilience, and power reverberate through the history of indigenous nations. The narratives we use matter. These are not solely academic debates. For example, narratives of the disappearing Indian and susceptibility to virgin soil epidemics explained away centuries of violence in North America and excused in the absence of investment in the public health infrastructure of indigenous communities. If the narrative everyone knows is indigenous peoples are doomed to die, why invest in helping them live? Currently in the United States, we are reaping the fruit of this mindset. American Indians are three times more likely to contract COVID-19, five times more likely to require hospitalization, and one and a half times more likely to die from the novel coronavirus than their white neighbors. Native Americans, like other minorities in the United States, were not born more vulnerable to COVID-19 they were made more vulnerable by a structurally violent world we all inherited. It is up to us to decide how we change that inheritance. In your country, indigenous peoples are fighting to protest pipelines, to break dams, to guard sacred spaces, and to free those in prison for practicing their own religion, speaking their own language, and telling their own story. It is my hope and the hope of each of us on this panel that you leave here today enraptured by a new way to look at history. We hope you're armed with a deeper understanding of how to find and how to listen to the indigenous stories of your homeland. We hope you join with us as the fight for sovereignty and survival continues in the face of a deadly pandemic and the astonishing potential of an increasingly connected digital world. For Ali, Wayne, Kyle, and Miguel, thank you so much for taking this journey with us.